All right, welcome back to Resilient Voices and Beyond. This is the overall 115th episode. So we are streaming along. This is season three, episode 2526. I'm figuring out by the end of this episode, I'll give y'all a definitive answer. Um, but so as we get things going. I would be remiss if I didn't give my gratitude and my thanks to the audience, to the fans, to the supporters, to the donors, and more. Um, thank you guys for continuing to support Resilient Voices and Beyond, continuing to support me individually, but also um, thank you for supporting the guests that I have on here in whatever fashion that may be. Um, please continue. If anything, please continue to show the love, show the support, trust and believe. For the many advocates that I've had on here, nonprofit executives and and more, all the different facets of people I've had on here, those comments, the the love, the likes, the shares, are monumental in our life. They help us get through our week, help us get through our day. So please continue to show your love and your support. If you have happened to stumble across this episode and you. Like, who is this person talking? I don't even know. What is Razeev Voices in the Eye? What is going on over here? I just wanted to get on Spotify or get on Apple to just find this one song I like. My name is Michael D. Davis Thomas, a.k.a. MDDT Speaks. I spent approximately 11 years within the Michigan Child Welfare System. Um, part of that being and the JJ side of that, spent a little time being a dual ward and then aged out on the foster care side of things. I went on um, to start advocating, start working in juvenile corrections, working with uh, foster care youth, doing youth care work, uh, coach counseling, uh, working alongside social workers, doing case management, uh, working within the mental health field and you name it. I've done a lot of different stuff within this field. I am not going to list off the whole resume, but just know um, I started at 15 working professionally in the child welfare system, sitting on boards and doing panels, and I'm 26 years old now. Um, so that should give you a testament of the work I've done in this time. So y'all just don't be like, who is this person out here talking? He ain't got no sweat in the game, you know. I have time and equity and experience lived and professional, which is why I'm here today. Um, but you guys are here to hear from me. Um, Lord knows I could talk. Uh, you guys are here for my guests. So without further ado, I'm going to have him introduce himself. Uh, hello, my name is Aiden. Um, I am 24 and I live in Western New York. Um, I am a foster care alumni. I grew up in foster care. Um, <clears throat> story's a little wonky there um, with how long I was in foster care. Um, but I've definitely spent my time in the system in a few different avenues, areas, as you will. Um, and I am just trying to find ways to use my experiences through um, my own different advocacy avenues, Planning Joy, other organizations, um, to just kind of show youth that they don't, or anybody, that they don't have to be a statistic. Like, it's okay to be the black sheep that you are always told is wrong to be like you don't have to conform to what anybody else wants you no one asked to be brought on this earth you were put here for a reason and you might as well spend that time investing in yourself and that reason and the right people will follow suit versus trying to force the wrong people to stay in your life due to comfort and different things like that Definitely. Such an honor and a privilege to have you on. Um, we're going to have fun. We're going to laugh, you know. Um, I have been so excited for this podcast <laughs> for a while. <laughs> Definitely. Well, my first question, um, as you guys may know in the audience, is help me in the audience understand the timeline of events that led to your now and um your why and what you do your work and you advocate? 
Um, so like I said, that story gets a little wonky, so bear with me for a minute. I will try and sum this up as quick as I can. Um, I know that can be kind of an issue for a lot of us. <laughs> um, so I used to say that my story started when I was nine years old, but I feel like it goes a little bit back further than that now. Um, when I was 22 months old, my mom and my father were in a really messy divorce. Um, I'm not going to get into the ins and out of it, but some different charges got mentioned. Um, to this day, I will never know if they fully happened because it was the horrific Arkansas justice system of 2002 and they wanted father to be guilty. Um, so... My dad ended up spending 10 years in prison for a crime he possibly didn't commit. I am not going to say this man is completely innocent by any means, but possibly not for that. Um, so I grew up believing that my bio father was just a complete and utter monster. I wanted nothing to do with him. So I clung to any family that I did have in that meantime because I trying to fill a void I didn't realize I had. Um, so I lived in Arkansas with my mom, my brother, and her business partner. I grew up raising birds and dogs because my mom had um, a very large bird breed business and also raised uh, puppies on the side. So I started working around when I was five years old, taking care of animals and helping haul bird seed into the house after school, different stuff like that. Um, and I grew up in a house where, unfortunately, abuse was very normalized. Um, I did not know in that house, because of all the good things that I experienced through learning the business and things like that, um, and how knowing how much my mom did love me, that other kids weren't going through what I was going through. That's why I wasn't allowed to have friends over at the house. The alcoholism that was going on from the business partner the abusive things that were going on the anger like that wasn't things that my mom wanted people to know about me and was trying to very hard to protect me um at the time I didn't understand that so I would go off because I couldn't have birthday parties and stuff like that not knowing down the road those birthday parties weren't going to mean anything um so at nine, I ended up having CPS come to my school, not knowing they had just left my brother's school. Um, why I bring up my father in the beginning is the same CPS worker that came to see me at my school when I was nine years old also was involved in my father's case. Um, I was told that as long as I told them the truth, I would not get taken from my mother, that I we get to go home and see her and we would live our normal lives. I just needed to tell them what was going on. Um, so I did. They, you know, asked me the same questions as my brother and told me some things he was, was saying. And they're like, you know, did these things happen? And I thought these were completely normal things happening in a house. So I was like, yeah, you know, we're we're bad kids like we did these things wrong so we had to be punished and these were the punishments and they just looked at me horrified um they were like okay well you know final bell just rang go ahead and head home as long as you don't miss any more days of school you will never see us again and I said okay deal and she was like make sure you tell your mother that and I said okay I can do that so I get home or I get out the door. My brother's waiting for me. And he goes, how was your day at school? And I was like, I don't know. How was your day at school? Because <laughs> we both knew, but didn't want to say it. And in the long and the short, um, we filled each other in, got home, filled my mom in. And about an hour after all of that, they showed up in three black SUV vans. Like It was like something out of a movie. Um, just three black SUV vans pulled up, told my mom and Paul they had to go somewhere else, told me and my brother we had to go over here. They started um, questioning us in those groups and then separate. And they told me and my brother to get in this van. And we started screaming. Um, we just, we wanted our mom. 
And we were like, we are not going anywhere with you till we talk to our mom. And they told us to shut up and stop screaming. And we'll get to say bye to our mom. So my brother consoled me, got me to calm down. That way we could say bye. Um, I don't know how much time passed. It felt like forever. And then the van was pulling off. Some lady got in, and as soon as she got in, the van was going. Um, We never said bye to my mom. I didn't get to see her for two weeks. I didn't even get my glasses um, until a few hours later when I was laying on the table in the DHS DHHS office because they didn't have anywhere for kids. Like we, we were a random circumstance. They didn't have a a playroom or a sleep area for us. So we were just in some random office area, sleeping on a table on our jackets. And they finally brought in our, in my glasses and a book of my brothers and told us we weren't allowed to have any other of our belongings because of the condition of the house. Um, There was cockroaches and mice. So we weren't allowed to have anything. Um, so they took us to go get clothes and then took us to a shelter where boys and girls weren't allowed to play together, even if they were siblings. Um, my brother ended up doing lines for me because I got in trouble. I was having a really bad day. Anthony was talking me through the bad day. I got in trouble for talking to a boy. So he did my lines for me. Fast forward, my mom cannot take custody back of us. She does not want us to go to care, so she sends me with her mom. Um, My mom's mom and stepdad drive 16 hours to come pick us up. We have one one one-hour visit with them, and they go, okay, these people seem great. You're going to go move 16 hours away to a new place, and you're going to go live with them. Um, so we drove in a car that was our bonding and getting to know them. Um, we ended up spending the night in the hotel halfway through, I think it was in like Kentucky or something. And they just started asking us all kinds of insane questions. They were being horrific, talking nasty about my mom. And we called children's services the next morning and said, we don't want to go here. And they were like, well, you have no choice. The papers have been signed. It'll get better. Um, so we got to Ohio, got assigned a new caseworker, got put in school. Um, I was treated like an absolute gem of a child for a year when that caseworker was there and they signed everything off. Um, more very intense abuse happened. My brother was working and an A student at the time though. So he never saw any of it. He never was part of any of it. When I turned 15, I ended up going to a detention center for elder abuse and domestic violence because I got out of a um, psych hospitalization stay. Um, I had tried to commit suicide and it was a really rough time in my life and they sent me back to Lisa and Dave's. And they... It was a very rough day and I tried to go for a walk, ended up, they claimed elder abuse when that was the exact opposite of what happened and called the police. And because I resisted arrest with the police, because I said this was unfair, I got thrown in handcuffs and literally thrown in the back of a police car and taken to the detention home. Nobody called my caseworker until I was already... Um, like, I don't know how many of us know the detention home process, but once I was already booked and all that and in a cell had met the crew, um, then they had called my caseworker. Um, he was absolutely appalled, but I ended up spending eight months in there because I decided to go to trial because I didn't want a domestic violence on my record and a felon in the state of Ohio or a high misdemeanor. Um, so because I did that, they ended up dropping it to disorderly conduct persisting. I got it expunged when I turned 18. Little did I know that that would cause me to get what I wanted of leaving Lisa and Dave's, but I never had a permanent placement after that. Um, 
after that, I bounced constantly. I think the longest place I stayed was a residential, and that was just about a year and a half. Um, for people who don't know, residential placements are essentially like ho- fenced-in hospital units that you stay long-term. <laughs> Uh, at least for Ohio, they always have them right around a sheriff's station. That way, if in case any of the kids decide to run away, they got backup. So it makes you feel real great. Um, I bounced from a, what's classified as like runaway domestic violence shelter for kids. It's a step down from the detention home if they don't think you're bad enough for it. Um, called turning point and then I went into a foster home for a little bit where I ended up getting kicked out for a syncopia attack that I didn't know until later on was a syncopia attack my entire body locked up my hands curled in and then my eyes like rolled back into the back of my head and my foster mom convinced my caseworker I was making it up and doing it all for attention and she was like I'm done So I got placed in a residential and my caseworker was like, look, we don't have anything else for you. So you're going to make the best of this. And if you run away, you're going back to detention, but you're old enough. They may send you to jail. So we were given raw food at this, at this residential. We were treated horrendous. The staff were literally pinning girls against each other um for fights we're bribing them with like bags of cheetos and stuff like that and being like hey if you go start something with them i'll bring you in a bag of takis tomorrow or just dumb shit like that and taking advantage of the stuff we couldn't have um and it was absolutely horrendous i was putting in reports weekly and they were like i'm i'm sorry i'm sorry kid there isn't nothing we can do. If we get this place shut down, you're screwed. Um, so I asked the place I was staying at what I could do to leave. Like, what was holding me there? And they said, you're either here till you're 18 or you graduate high school. So I was given five um, classes worth of work in September and told, when you finish that, we'll give you your finals. And if you graduate, you can leave you can go to college you can get emancipated whatever you want september to december right before winter break i got all five classes done they had everything graded january 4th january 10th i moved into my college dorm at kent state because i graduated i didn't even have my high school diploma yet i had never lived alone and i got thrown into campus dorm life and went here you go so I ended up flunking out my first semester um my best friend passed away and I had no support my caseworkers were coming out weekly or bi-weekly they were phenomenal but they could not help me on campus there was nothing they could do to support me better in that Um, so when I ended up failing, I came back and went to a border house that gave me a three strike system. And I was literally getting strikes for leaving a door unlocked or a window open. Um, so I ended up getting picked out because I stayed out past my curfew, even though I was 19, um, and got put in another random border house type situation where the guy, was on some drug and came into my room naked and I decided that night living on the street was better so for the next four or five months until I turned 19 and could figure out a better option I lived on the streets with my friend and then out of desperation called my bio dad and asked him to come pick me up And I lived with him in Illinois for two years. And because of that, Children's Services kind of wiped their hands of my case and said, since you're in contact with him, we can't give you services anymore. We're not going to help you as soon as you leave the state. 
Um, so after that and moving with my dad and really taking a hard look at all the different things in my life, I decided I didn't want to go into just being a therapist or a caseworker where I was bound by these policies and have to look somebody in the face and go, I know the thing that'll be able to help you. And I'm sorry, I can't do it. I could never be put in a position to do that. So I decided to start sharing my story, the goods, the bads, and the ugly, and really starting to try and work on activism work in any way I could get my hands on and starting to do policy change because that is where my true heart is. We can't have any true change in the system until we are looking these senators and these big mans on campuses in the face and go, you're doing a bad job. You need to do better. Um, and so I hope to do that. I also hope to help um, places of employment. It's what I'm doing currently. Um, I go to or I'm going to be going to different places um, like Walmart, Wegmans, things like that, and looking at their employee handbooks and finding ways that they can use more open-ended language, um, helping them instead of just having a list of everything you cannot have on the job, being more um, mental health and coping skill friendly to where you have a list of, okay, these are all the fidget and stimming options you can have you do not have to ask anybody for this instead of just a list of everything you can't have here's a clear list of everything you can um also working letting them know hey i get you're trying to be gender inclusive this is not very gender inclusive language here's another way you could word this to make your employees feel really accepted and welcome um I haven't mentioned it, but I am a trans man. And so a lot of my activism as well goes very heavily into trans work and making sure not just trans people, but any different minority group, since I am in a few myself, has a chance not only to have their voice heard, but to a chance to be given the foundation to build the confidence to actually use that voice. Cause we can tell somebody they can use their voice all day, but if we don't give them the root foundation and confidence, they're never going to use it. Um, so yeah, there's kind of my spiel. Sorry for all of that. No, no, no. You answered my question in its entirety. Um, <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to go back a little bit within it um man you, you you've been through a lot you've been through a lot um and that is just the pg icing on the cake. <laughs> <laughs> um i i can i can relate to um the point you were uh sharing about i believe you were saying your mom you know kind of put a kind of sheltered view of what you saw and what you do about life for a period of time. And it only gave you a certain sense of what reality was, you know? So when you got into, yeah. <laughs> when you got into, for the lack of better words, the real world, you know, reality as we know it, what did that, what did that feel like for you and how, Oh, was there a shocking moment when you went to school and you realized other friends, other classmates didn't have to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh what, my can, goodness, can you yeah. talk to me a little bit about that distinct moment when you like, oh, so y'all don't do this? <laughs> so there are two distinct moments real quick before I touch that. I will say it is still a shock. Um, I, just left um, uh, my partner of six years um, back in September. And a lot of our relationship looking back was him telling me a lot of what a normal childhood was. Cause I would just out of the blue, like talk about a childhood experience 
not realizing that that should have a trauma tied to it. And he would just kind of look at me sideways and be like, what? I'm like, you didn't have to do that. I thought everybody had to do that. And so it was just a constant of that in our relationship. Um, And I really commend him for how he handled that sometimes because (laughs) there were some stories that he took like a champ. Um, But the two distinct moments where I reconnected with a one of my absolute best friends she is still near and dear to my heart and I see her as family um where I called Elizabeth at nine when I had moved back to Ohio and I was like I'm so sorry (laughs) and she was like why are you apologizing where did you go like I don't need a sorry I just want to know you're okay and I was like I think I'm okay like I'm safe now it's like I I didn't realize that apparently the things I went through aren't normal. And she was like, well, what do you mean? And so I just went on a like two hour long info dump of my childhood from my lens. And she goes, I never in a million years would have known that you were going through any of that. She was like, you were just one of my best friends and so happy. And Elizabeth was just like, constantly talking in that about like how strong I was and remember this is a conversation with two nine-year-olds she hadn't as far as I know hadn't been through major traumas in that sense so she was just shell-shocked and trying to process um and I, I love her to this day um But that was a very eye-opening moment for me just kind of sitting in my bedroom quietly telling one of my best friends like hey I essentially live this double life from you and the whole time I remember feeling guilty for that like I felt guilty for lying to my best friend when in reality she was like I'm so sorry you went through any of this in the first place and I just remember how much guilt I took on myself for other people's actions And that continued until when I was older. And when I went to Kent for the first time, I went to a frat party and um, I was trying real hard to be one of the guys and just hang out. And I have never felt more alone in a crowd full of people. And it really hit me how I don't think I've had a single childhood memory that was like a typical child and when I was sitting there drunk and on a bunch of drugs at a frat party it just hit me and all of that guilt I had been holding for years that I did something wrong in that just came flooding all at once and I remember just walking out of the party so dissociated and Kent used to have this running joke, they probably still have it, um, where you would just run out kind of in the sidewalks and stuff, especially at night, because the only thing running were the buses. So if a bus hit, you go ahead, pay my tuition. <laughs> um, it's horrible thinking back now, but <laughs> everyone on campus had a thing with that. And that was one of my core memories from Kent. So do with that what you will. But I remember walking out of this party and truly not caring if the bus hit me, not about my tuition and all of those feelings from my childhood of like being suicidal because of other people and all that guilt just hit real heavy. And I don't know how I made it back to my dorm room, but I did. And I called my caseworker and I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And she was like, nobody does you're 17 it's okay it's like no 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 no. you don't understand like it's bad I don't think I'm gonna make it this semester like I'm going to flunk I I I messed up essentially I was like I need you and she ended up coming out the next morning and I just sat with her and told her all of the traumas that I hadn't told children services before I was like, 
I don't know what to do. And the fact that I have this entire time felt like it was my fault and like the lack of not having a childhood is now hitting me. And I don't know what to do with that. My brain just wants to go to more self-deprecating things and I know I can't. And she ended up getting me enrolled in therapy. Um, I attempted to finish out the semester and Kathy was one of my biggest supports in that time and really helped me process that shock and gave me a safe place. We would just drive around in her car when I moved back to Lorraine and she gave me normal teenage experiences and showed me what that should look like. So I didn't have as much of a shock as I continued to get older. Um, I also have my mom back in my life now. And now that I'm over 21, I get to kind of have my mom as my best friend. Um, And so that has helped me finish processing all of that culture shock and also get to kind of relive some of those teenage experiences. Like if I get too drunk and wanting my mom to like take care of me for the night, um, different things like that. And so I do feel like I still have missed out on a lot, but it doesn't feel quite as detrimental anymore. I want to step back a couple of things. Um, you brought up some very distinct points that I, I believe can be helpful in some ways for some of the audience members listening and for some of those other people that may be listening on behalf of some of the youth or you know young adults that they serve. Um, Definitely. You talked about your experience with school, but also you spoke um, in, in, in different pieces about um, your journey within mental health. Um, so a couple things. When did mental health and self-care become a little, you, you became aware of it. When did you become aware of it? And then when did you start to be strategic and create a plan for it? My other question outside of that is, you mentioned not having a successful uh, semester in school. Um, what were some of the barriers outside of just the mental health component to it? Some of the other barriers that um, ultimately didn't um, help you be successful. And what are some of the things you know now um, as you take a, a different lens um, that could have helped you be successful and strategic and planning um, to pursue education? Okay, I got this. Um, so on the first aspect, mental health became apparent to me when I was five years old. Um, not self-care, but mental health. That was the first time I was ever, so I'm going to get real dark here for a minute and I apologize to you guys, but that was the first time I got actively suicidal and homicidal. Um, That is the first moment we can ever pinpoint. Um, So I'm also diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder and they believe this was one of the big split moments. Um for my brain in its sense to cope. I was starting to really learn that Paul was not a good man. I was seeing the detriments of his alcoholism. I was a CSI kid. I grew up on that. It was my mom's hyperfixation. So it didn't take me long to catch on. Um, So I started learning like the way he was treating others wasn't okay, but I'd never learned that for myself until way later in life. And so he got to the point of his alcoholism where he started having me gather his meds for him in the morning. Um, And he taught me to buy the color of them, how, like what med he was supposed to take. And he would get belligerent drunk by the, by seven o'clock in the morning when he needed this med. So he wasn't paying attention to what I gave him. And I remember playing potion master with, his medication hoping I would cause something to happen and because nothing ever did I felt like I was failing my mom and 
I remember just waking up every day after that, not wanting to wake up anymore and like being angry that I woke up. Um, And when I got taken away at nine, I got, I was mandated by the courts, my brother and I to have two years of therapy and they preached like self care and taking care of yourself. But I never understood what that meant because I was also being told by my mom's mom and stepdad that my problems were my problems to deal with and everybody has their own shit. So you do not put your own problems on anyone else. So I learned self-care in the sense of self-care is entirely based on yourself. You can never ask for support in any way to get self-care. And because I couldn't not take care of the things going on in my life, it just was never important. I did not start prioritizing self-care myself and setting adequate boundaries actually until last year when I met my current partner, Alex. Um, They really helped me a lot with setting boundaries. And I learned that I don't have to be everybody's everything and their go-to. And I, I need to do that for myself. Um, as for your other question, do you remember that? (laughs) Because I do not. (laughs) Yes, my other question, um, kind of, um, teeters off of the mental health and self-care, um, but goes into the component of your education. So you weren't successful, you know, and mental health held a huge part from me listening in on the, um, um, the unsu- unsuccessful uh, semester, but also um, we know all too well, there's a lot of different things that go into not having a successful semester. Um, so what were some of the other barriers and components um, that contribute contributed to that um, unsuccessful semester of school? Um, and what, were, what are some of the strategies tips and um, tools that could have benefited you and that you see now that um, uh, you could have used or other students can use in your same circumstance? So the big three for myself, and then I have a few others that I unfortunately ruined for myself. So don't be like me and I will tell you how to not be like me. Um, The first three for myself, I feel like mental health was very fixated on when I was a kid. I was super psychoanalyzed all the time. However, because I had such, so many different types of trauma, I've always scored a 12 on the ACE test. So they saw that first. Um, I did not get properly diagnosed with autism or ADHD until um, about 20 Um, and I feel like that was a very big barrier for me at Kent, um, not having certain, like not being able to go to the disability office there and be like, Hey, I have these things going on. Um, I, I really need some extra help. And I feel like not having those two diagnoses. And then while I know, Children's services meant the absolute best, and they were so excited for me because even with everything I had been through, they were excited to see me kind of overcome all of that and be the first person to live at the dorms without a foster parent or anything like that. And I was 17, like all these different things I was doing was unheard of at the time for my County. Um, And they really put me very high on a pedestal and put a lot of pressure on me to not fail. And they were just like, you know, if you succeed in this, think of all of the kids that are 17 that can't get emancipated, but could have this option and don't have to spend another year in a residential. And they use that as motivation, but it really fueled my people pleasing and my need to not think of myself. And I was like, well, I got, I 
have to do this for all of these people that I'm gonna let down that I don't even know who they are if they're ever gonna exist but I I have to do this um and it was very hard to separate my own identity from kind of feeling like children's services poster child a little bit Um, Because at the time I was also doing um, like foster care classes for foster parents. And I was telling them kind of all the things not to do as a foster parent. They had the other two people on the board that would like share their good experiences. And I would be like, okay, now that you heard all that, here's what I went through that I wish my foster parents didn't do. Okay, thanks. Um, and just really kind of made that name for myself that I, I wasn't going to take any of that. Um, I helped out with Purple Project with Letitia Watts. Um, she is a f- fantastic woman, gave me a lot of opportunities through Purple Project um, with volunteering. And just like I was the photographer one year and just really helping me network and kind of get my voice out there. Um, and really helped me learn that there's people who want to hear that. They don't only want or need to hear the good and kind of too many people only share the good. Um, so I would say for people going into that, if they have similar experiences, even in the slightest, if you feel any pressure from children's services, cut it out. <laughs> no. Um, children's services may take care of things for you, but at the end of the day, they have to, no matter how you are. So when you're a kid, that is the time you need to be finding yourself. Don't put all of yourself into being the best for children's services. Um, I really think if I would have taken that time as a kid, it would have helped me so much more in college because I wouldn't have been trying to find that identity. Um, and then also don't be afraid of the labels. Like I get everyone's like, oh, a label doesn't define you. And absolutely it does not. But unfortunately our society is ran by labels. And if you want support, especially for autism or ADHD, nine times out of 10, at least for New York state, if you are not diagnosed with ADHD or autism before 18, you don't get disability supports for them especially in school um so that has been its own issue and I have not been able to do typical college learning because of that so I stick to online learning because I can go at my own pace and put my own supports in place that I need Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your uh, vulnerability as well. Um, of course. I truly, I truly appreciate you sharing that, you know, um, your story and sharing it in your own unique way because oftentimes I, I record and I talk to people and everyone has their own unique way. But um, one thing that I like to do here on this space is bring authenticity, you know, and um, much like yourself, like I, I could see myself, you know, I was that, I guess, quote unquote, my state uh, children's services, you know, MDHS individuals um, in my younger days would say will be a rebel, you know. Uh, yes. So I definitely, um, I definitely see that. But also for the, for the young people out there, you know, um, that are looking at individuals like myself and yourself, um, take note, like, you know, please live your childhood, you know, uh, find yourself, you know, allow yourself grace and mercy, you know, please allow yourself some grace because it's a, it's, it's a hard and it's a cold world when you continue to allow yourself to live in a place of stress and pressure. Uh And if you aren't given the chance to heal your inner child as a child and live those experiences out, do not be afraid to do it as an adult. 
yeah just color in your coloring book watch the disney movie Man. like <laughs> and let me tell let me t- let me let me tell you this as i get ready uh to end this out here you know i have a few more questions um Trauma's going to heal whether you allow it <laughs> or not. All right. It's going to find its way to the surface of your life, whether you want it or not. So um, it's it's better when you allow yourself to have that space to heal so it doesn't feel as though your life is uprooting and upending out of nowhere and everything is going wrong. Um, because I, I've been there. I've, I've been there seen it you know it seems like a lot of self-sabotage and lo and behold i need i need to deal with some stuff you know i need to work on me you know it wasn't it wasn't this person it was me you know um it was that is such a hard lesson (laughs) um just make sure that you allow yourself that space um as we get ready to end here um what advice would you like to leave here today Um, I guess the big thing, like I said in the beginning and what I titled this episode, like, do not be afraid to be your most authentic black sheep self. Like, I got told so many times in care, like, you don't want to be this statistic. Don't grow up to be this statistic. Grow up to be this one. You don't have to be any statistic. You can just be whatever your name is, whatever your identity is, any of that. And you can just be you and love that and accept that. Because at the end of the day, you did not ask to be born. You did not be like, hey, what's up? Hello, I want to go to Earth. (laughs) Like, nobody did that. So I feel at the end of the day, the only thing we can gift ourselves since we didn't ask to be here and have to deal with the hellhole that is this life is you owe it to yourself whatever you need or want your soul is calling towards do it it doesn't matter who's in your life holding you back i have lost everyone i ever thought i cared about time and time again i am on about my fifth time of this it's hard uprooting but there's pluses in it. And now I feel like I truly have my people in my corner and I can be my full goblin mode however I need to be. And they are so accepting and loving of that. And just, if I need to disappear for a month, they're like, oh, Aiden's back around. Awesome. Nice to see ya. They don't sit there and treat me harshly for that like people in my past have. So the people who do care and do truly matter will accept you however you need to be so just learn that as soon as you can and learn who you are as soon as you can because there's there's truly no time to waste life is too long and too short at the same time definitely definitely keeping track of time I want to be mindful Um, I truly appreciate you just being so open and sharing your story I appreciate uh-huh. you having me here and having this platform for people to be able to do this. Yeah, yeah. You hit so many different things. And just to hit a couple, you talked about, you know, uh, dealing with your childhood trauma and well into your adulthood, navigating school and, and the pressures of, of society, um, the labels, you know, um, good and bad, you know, Um dealing with alternative realities of what life is versus what it actually is, you know, um, right. You navigated a lot. Um, and I, and I appreciate you sharing that because I know that there's some young people, some, some older people, some, some medium people who are in between <laughs> that may be listening to this and, and needed to hear that message whenever they listen to this, as I get ready to end, um, um, I'm going to be adding in um, Aiden's uh, link tree so y'all can connect with him. You know, y'all can follow, you know, like, subscribe, support, whichever, you know. Yes, Uh, anyone needs to reach out for anything. Y'all are more than welcome. However is easiest for you, it is in the link tree. Definitely. Okay, hold on, pause. 
okay click shouldn't have clicked my computer it went to a whole different screen um but uh <laughs> i'm going to be adding that in the description along with this so if you're looking to how you can connect that's how you can connect with him um i realize we talked about some heavy things today and it can be potentially triggering you know so just take some time if you're listening to this on your way to work on your way home wherever you're listening to this center yourself get back to baseline practice some mindfulness deep breathing techniques also oh, i realize sometimes that ain't even health <laughs> so sometimes um, you just it, need to scream it, it out for a yeah, minute and get it out right. so if that's your regulation tool as long as you're being safe and healthy about it <laughs> i ain't out here promoting violence <laughs> definitely definitely if it's something that you may have put away or build some blocks or some walls in your head about it just listen to this episode and it's opened a door to some things that you thought has came and passed um and you're looking for resources to be able to process and deal with some of these things feel free to reach out to myself you know, I would love to help you navigate that journey of healing where you are finding the resources within your area, um, if need be. But that being said, it is the holiday season. Understand that it is not always kind to us people who have um, childhood traumas or experience the system as you know it. Uh, so please, you know, check on your friends, check on your loved ones, check on your people with lived experience, you know, send them some love, send them some um, kindness. But also, uh, there's a lot of people out there suffering in silence um, because they're afraid to ask for help or they don't know how to. You know, um, whenever you listen to this, use your discernment <laughs> um, and reach out to someone, you know, that you haven't spoke to in a while. Maybe work got too busy or life just start life in and you just haven't had the time. I'm not telling you to reach out to your your toxic ex or whoever, you know, please, you know, uh, at your discretion, reach out to someone. The toxicity in 2023. Look, please don't. And don't, and don't, and don't be like what Michael said, you know, no, 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 no. That is not what happened. Um, but please do that. Also, we are in a season of cold influenza, pneumonia, uh, COVID, all these different, um, frigid viruses and different things like that please bundle up please wear the proper gears for the weather um take in some extra vitamins and water this time definitely. of year um if you live in some cities up north most of all of us are vitamin d deficient get you some vitamin d vitamins get you some uh, looking at you you new yorkers <laughs> definitely <laughs> definitely every you one know. of us are on vitamin d here also, please just make sure you're washing your hands, you know, um, please make sure you're washing your hands in your sleeves, carry you some hand sanitizer, but please do not supplement hand sanitizer for washing your hands. Hand sanitizer still leaves a percentage of germs on your hands. So um, please take some time to actually wash your hands in the midst of um, using hand sanitizer. That being said, there's also a lot of people I've had on here who have their own nonprofit books, businesses, um, you name it. Um, if you're looking for a place to donate to support this holiday season, please look through the repertoire of episodes that I have um, and choose one of those individuals. A lot of them come um, come from very small businesses or or um, I have a few people who actually have some large uh, nonprofits, you know, so choose one of those, you know, and, and, and buy one of their books, you know, um, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, the podcast can always use some help and some support. You know, we are completely self-funded, you know, um, and these subscriptions cost. So I have a GoFundMe. Go <laughs> Definitely. I have a GoFundMe currently running to be able to sustain the podcast for two years. Um, currently, we reached a goal, uh, I believe $250 have been hit on that. So we're at uh, 1700 and something uh, dollars, you know, within that. Um, so anything helps, you know, I'm looking for some sponsors. Um, but also, if you can just donate the one time, that works as well. So uh, with that being said, this has been Resilient Voices and Beyond. Episode, I want to say 25. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to say that, but just to, just to be concise. 
I just listened to your last episode too. Just, <laughs> no just, just to be concise, it is episode. Look, 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 me looking it up right now. Uh, 20, it's episode 26. It's episode 26, uh, the 115th episode. Y'all gonna get on me so much. I need to remember. I'm sorry. When you start getting it, it, it all merges together, but uh, I promise. <laughs> um, with that being said, you guys have a good night, good morning, good whenever you listen to this until we talk again. Thank you. <laughs>